Good evening. Good evening. Good to see you all out. What a pleasant evening we have, even though the wind's got a little bit of a bite to it, doesn't it? But it's still a pleasant evening to be able to come to the house of the Lord and worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, continue to pray for Shoney Run this week, our sister church. Uh, of course, the tithes and offerings go in the back. Uh, we don't have it on our in the bulletin, but don't forget our digital sign fund. We are still working toward that. Uh, continue to pray uh, for that. Uh, the finance committee did meet today. Our business meeting will be Wednesday evening following our uh, prayer time and Bible study or right afterwards. Please submit names for candidates and uh, for a deaconship uh, and put them in the basket. Uh, we got several names today. Uh, we have them and then I hear, heard uh, Brother Gary say that there's a few more that he took in a little bit ago, so be in prayer, constant prayer for that. Also, if your phone number has changed or if you are not getting or receiving, is there anybody that is not receiving the call them all calls that you're aware of? Everybody pretty much receiving those? If you talk to anybody and they're not receiving those, there's a possibility that that their phone number got kicked out of the system, or if they've changed their phone number. Uh, huh? Uh, Kenny talked to him today. Okay, because it is kicked out. Yeah, he is kicked out, but I put it on okay. about two weeks ago. I put it back on there. Yeah. But if you talk to someone and they're not receiving them, or they have changed their phone number, tell them just let me know, and I'll be glad to go back in and and put that on there for them. Operation Christmas Child Shoebox Ministry is collecting in November personal uh, notes and photos. Uh, write a personal note and take a photo or, and give them, pass them on to Sister Judy and she'll make sure they get placed in the boxes as they are. It won't be long till they'll be, when do they get shipped out, Judy? It's the middle about the 20th of uh, November. Open prayer times on Tuesday mornings at 9 o'clock. Uh, come join us if you have the opportunity uh, to join us just one Tuesday morning or if you can make it a regular time on Tuesday mornings to join us. We'd love to have you be a part of that. We have a great time there. Uh, other opportunities are a Bible study and prayer on Wednesday evenings at 6 o'clock. So we'll be in prayer for that continually. Scripture verse of the week. For if by the trespass of one man death reigned through that one man how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man Jesus Christ and that comes from Romans 5 17 let's go to the Lord we're in one more I don't think there's any children here so I want to announce that if anybody didn't get their gift bag I thank the children that didn't receive theirs got them this morning before they left. So let's go to the Lord and word of prayer and ask God to bless our time of being together tonight, okay? Our Heavenly Father, in the quietness of the moment, we just want to come thanking you. Thank you, Lord, for the time that we can gather back together in your house. Thank you for the freedom and liberty that we have to do that, Lord. Father, we know and understand there's many parts of the world that can't do what we've assembled to do here tonight, and that is to come and to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice that you made, an ultimate sacrifice it was, Lord, from the cross of Calvary to shed your blood to make the atonement for our sins become a substitute for something that we could not pay for, Lord. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you for your watch care over us, and we pray your divine protection upon us and pray for your guidance upon this church family, Lord. Father, may in every undertaking that we do here, may it be, may it be by your guidelines. Father, we'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. And Father, right now, we just ask that if we have, that as we have assembled together, Father, you just bless my brother Ronnie as he leads us in song and hymn. Bless Miss Ruby as she uh, works the media system and uh, her 
sisters and brothers that play the instruments and each of the voices of the congregation, Lord, that we will come together in harmony, uh, Father, to uh, lift up songs of praise, thanking you, Lord, continually for the many blessings of this life, most of all for eternal life through Jesus Christ. Father, we also ask that you'd be with those that are sick. Uh, Father, some of our elderly, uh, Lord, are not feeling well. Uh, Lord, it's hard for them to get back to church at night. And God, I pray you'd bless them right now. I pray you'd just reach down and let them know that we miss them, Lord, dearly. Uh, Father, I pray that you'd be with those that have had loved ones to go on recently. And just continue to nurture and bless and comfort them in their times of need, Lord. May we as a church family continue to reach out to them. God, we just thank you for the many, many blessings that you bestow upon us. And right now, I just ask that all that's said and done will be to just be submissive to you and to ask you to remove and bind Satan from this place that, Lord, we could just have the freedom of liberty. We welcome you, sweet Holy Spirit of God, to come into our midst and make yourself known and, and uh, enlighten us. Give us understanding, Lord, tonight from your word. Father, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. And we pray all this in the sweet name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. All right, brother. <coughs> Good evening. Good evening. Start out with... 5.33, he leaves. Let's all stand, please. I serve a risen Savior He's in the world today. I know that he is living whatever men may say.
<laughs> I do the same thing. <laughs> but that's a, ain't that a true, true song? Amen. He lives within my heart. Mm. 573. Set my soul on fire. <laughs>
seated. Thank you, Brother Ronnie. Yes, sir. Glad to be a child of the King, aren't you? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Turn with me tonight in your Bibles to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. First Timothy chapter three. Everybody have a good evening. Yeah. Good. How many got a good nap in? <laughs> Judy. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Chapter three in the First Timothy. Stand with me if you can. On behalf of the authoritative, infallible. Precious, precious word of God. Beginning in verse 1, chapter 3. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, a striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, least being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without. Least he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, or given much wine, not greedy, or filthy lucre. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience, let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanders, sober, Faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own houses well. For they that have used the office of a deacon will purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Let's pray, please. Our Heavenly Father, once again, we humble our hearts before you tonight. We come to you as children of the King. Father, thank you. Thank you, sweet Holy Spirit of God, for being in our midst. We welcome you tonight. Father, I, as your servant, ask you right now to please forgive me of any and all wrongdoings, of any sin. God, that you might use me as a vessel tonight for your glory. God, you'd anoint me and use me as your mouthpiece. God, to speak your truth. Use me for your glory tonight, Father. Father, bless this congregation. Bless us, Father, as we move forward. Let it be under your guiding hand, Lord. That in all that we do, it will be honoring to you. Father, I thank you for those that are here tonight. I thank you for those that are not here tonight. Lord, I thank you for the part of the body that they are, even though they're not here wherever they are. Sweet Holy Spirit of God, I pray right now that you'd minister to their hearts. Let them know that we love them. Let them know that we miss them. Bless them with whatever needs they might have, Lord. Father, I know that some are sick. Father, for various reasons, Father. Father, this virus that's going around. Oh, just so many things that seem to come into the world today to, that Satan uses to try to hinder us as a body of believers and even gathering together to worship you. God, we love you and we thank you. And I thank you for watching over us and I pray, God, tonight, Father in Jesus, 
Jesus' sweet name, sweet Holy Spirit of God, I pray you'll continue to keep your hand of protection upon us as a body of believers. I pray you continue to allow us to gather together to be a witness in the community that we love you and for your glory, Father, in the very near future that we would begin our outreach, Lord, to reach the many lost souls that are out there because there are many. But right now, we just ask that you'd put your blessings upon your word. Father, you'd just uh, minister to our hearts and let us have open minds and being receptive to your word. Father, in what you do and all that you do, we'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. Father, if there be anybody that needs to make any kind of decision tonight, I pray, God, that in the name of Jesus, that tonight might be the night that you might bring conviction, that you might pierce our hearts to the very depth within, Lord, of the needs that we might have, Lord, to walk a more holy life with you. So, Father, we ask it all in the sweet and the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, I talked to you this morning about uh, how important it was to choose the right person as we talked about. We have an election coming up. We're talking about electing some deacons for our church body and moving forward. And we talked about how important that was. We talked about how important that was because here's the thing, friends, as I was reminded by a dear friend, one of our own, this morning as we was leaving. He said, and what we're about to do, he said, uh, is a great undertaking. It's a great undertaking for this very reason, friends, and listen closely. Because it will be, and it will determine the direction in which our church goes. When we began to elect deacons to serve in the church to fulfill the responsibility in which God calls them to fill, from the word of God that will direct our body of believers in the direction in which we're going to go. Amen. And we all want to be on the same page. And to be on the same page, we want to abide by the holy, infallible word of God. That's the only way we can do it. Because as I said this morning, we are a Bible-believing church. Amen. So we will stand upon the word of God doing that and so uh, maybe we just pay close attention and tonight as we look at this and we look at the book of Timothy you know Paul had left Timothy at Ephesus for a reason he left Timothy and encouraged Timothy and challenged Timothy there at Ephesus to build the church that was Paul's heart's desire was to build the church and that's what we're in the process of doing. We're in the process of building our church. And we want to build it for the glory of God. We don't want to build it to feel good about ourselves. We don't want to build it to feel good about somebody else. We want to build this church, God's church, for the glory of God. Because in the book of Timothy, he explains to us that the director of the church is the pastor. And that the deacon of the church are leaders to help. And then there's the doctrine of the churches, which is what we go by, and Jesus Christ being the head of all. We do know that Christ is the head of everything. Uh, if we take him out from being the leader, then we'd be in deep trouble. But we are a Bible-believing church, and we do stand upon the Word of God. So may the Lord continue to direct our hearts and lives. But a, a, a pastor's position, a, a deacon's position is a very, as I shared with you this morning, a, a very highly respected position, my friends. It's a very highly respected. You know, I've told and I've heard said, and maybe you've heard said, that there's not a lot of difference in the position of being a deacon and a pastor. There's not a lot of difference. The deacon plays that pretty much same role, has pretty much the same responsibilities to, in many ways, and are called to be accountable in the same way. And so, you know, some have even said, and you've probably heard this, that to be elected, now I want you to listen to this and, and let this sink in. To be called upon to become the president of the United States 
is to take a step down from being a pastor or a deacon. That's how important this role is. That's why it's so significant in understanding that we must abide by the word of God. And we must follow through with the things in which God says that we be qualified under the qualification, qualifications in which Christ mentions here in the word, or Paul, which is the word of God. But the deacon's position is to overlook, to oversee, to superintend, the oversight of responsibility. There's a lot of responsibility that comes in being a deacon. A lot more than sometimes people realize. You know, I've seen it done, and I know you've seen it, probably heard about it, but I've seen it happen in churches where people come forward and people bring, uh, they, they present names for candidates and people are elected as uh, deacons in the church and they come and they have hands laid on them and, and as Miss... Uh, what was her name now? Miss uh, uh, Granny May. Granny May from the church first, first church of pastor down in Bethlehem. Granny May told me, and used to tell me all the time. She said, Brother Lynn, she said, we got deacons, but they just won't deacon. They just won't deacon, Brother Lynn. <laughs> that happens. But with the right guidance and under the right leadership, a deacon body can really build a church. A deacon body can really build a church, friends, if they'll take the responsibility seriously. We talked about this morning how serious it was to, first of all, fear the Lord. You know, college and seminary degrees are not to be disrespected. As a matter of fact, or be honored in many ways. But they can't make up for the character in which God will bestow upon a man that is placed in that position and by the experiences in which you will find yourself in and growing from along the way. As I said in the end of the ser ending the service this morning, it'll be, it, it'll be wonderful. It'll be so enlightening to you. It'll be such a privilege to you to grow under the leadership and lordship of the sweet Holy Spirit of God. Uh, I know that uh, I, I told somebody the other day, uh, I think Kenny and Lord was eating dinner one day this past week. I forget where we were, but I was telling them, I said, and I, I've shared with you, I said, you know, I, I robbed myself of an education. Even in college, I just wanted to get through school. I just wanted the degree. I just wanted to get it over with, you know. And I could have learned so much more. But you know, even if I had stayed and took another couple of years to done my degree rather than to rush through it or the seminary studies that I've done, I don't believe they compare or even come close to the experiences that God gives us firsthand Amen. and being the children of God that we are when he calls us to do something, especially places us in the role of being a pastor or a deacon. And so it's a very important role. There are a lot of things that Paul mentions here and sharing with Timothy about building the church and gathering together those that are qualified to be the deacon uh, body. And I want to just talk about a few things tonight. Uh, I'm not going to be able to get through them all. Uh, it would literally take 10 or 15 sermons to get through them all, but I, I do have about six things I'd like to talk to you about. And these are six things that God has shown me over the years. They're not six things that are picked up from somebody else. They're six things that are picked up from the very word of God in this uh, leadership role and understanding the importance of it. And the first one is to be filled with the Spirit. I truly believe that God says that we must be filled with the Spirit Amen. in order to fill this role. I remember when Moses was uh, back in the book of Exodus and God had told him, Moses, because of your sin there in the wilderness of Zen, he said, you're not going to be able to enter the promised land, but you can go up on Mount Nebo and, and look over into the promised land. And, and Moses had such a heart for the church, for the congregation. He said, Lord, he said, please, he said, uh, let somebody, because he knew that the Lord was about to call him home, take him home. 
He said, Lord, he said, please, he, let, he said, uh, choose somebody to come. And in other words, he wanted to make sure that uh, those leaders, uh, that one that was going to come, that person that was going to be selected to, to help take care of the flock was going to be a true man of God. You remember what the Lord told Moses? He said, go down and pick Joshua, a man that's filled with the Spirit. Amen. Need be filled with the Spirit. Need be filled with the Spirit. I mean, the fruit of the Spirit are characteristics after being filled with the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, and against such there is no law. But he says, in being filled with the Spirit, God's Spirit, in other words, you need to have that light of Christ. What Jesus said, Jesus said in John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 12, he said, uh, I spake unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. And he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Being filled with the Spirit is to have the light of Christ in you, is to have the likeness of Christ in you, to have the characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit. In Numbers, Moses was concerned about the people. I believe also that being filled with the Spirit is that insinuation of being born again, as we call it, or as Jesus called it in John's Gospel, chapter 3. One must be born again. Born again with the Spirit of God, not only by blood, but by the Spirit. Be born again. Spiritually, seeing spiritually, this is part of the fearing of the Lord that we talked about this morning. Secondly, the thing that I truly think, and God showed me this from the book of Nehemiah, is a man that's going to be placed in this position not only needs to fear God and be filled with the Spirit, being born again, having the light of Christ, but he must be a man of truth. He must be a man that's trustworthy. A man of truth, a man that's trustworthy. A man that won't tell stories or deceive people by doing things that he knows is dishonest. I've seen that happen so often. In other words, filled with the Spirit is God's Spirit. Filled with the truth is God's Word. It's a moral doctrine. A moral education of God's Word will educate us as children of God. It will help us to become virtuous, honest, responsible, compassionate. It will inform us, reflect in us important, controversial moral issues. A moral education of God's Word will help us make sense of life itself. That's what the light of Christ does. And as the light of Christ in us shines and God molds us into being the man that God wants us to be, then we not only grow from that, it's like becoming a Sunday school teacher. You know, at first people are kind of fearful sometimes of, of teaching, but then once you surrender and submit, knowing that God wants you to do it, that you begin to dig into the Word of God. You begin to learn more. You begin to grow like God wants you to grow. And not only do you grow, but you begin to grow in such a fashion that you want to help others to grow like you are growing. You want others to see like you see. You want the blinders to be removed from people that can't see and can't understand the spiritual things of God, the, the light of God in a person, the, the, the desire, the truth of God, the spirit of God in the heart and life of a man that's going to be the leader within a family of God. Being filled with the truth educates us with the death, burial, and resurrection and the hope of the resurrection in our Lord. I believe also not only the being filled with the Spirit, having the fear of God and the truth within our lives is this thing that Paul teaches Timothy here in verse 1. It's a little word, and a lot of people look over it. I actually looked over it a lot of times in my life along the way until I really sensed what God was saying in that little word. 
That little word is desire. Desire. Back in Exodus this morning, we talked about Moses calling those to be in leadership roles, and he said that they needed to be men of truth and uh, able. Desire means willingness, a heart filled with God, with the same thinking and reasoning of God through God's word, for the same mission that God himself came to this earth for. And that is to look for lost souls and to reach out to lost souls, and that's done through the light of Christ that's within our lives. And that light is to be over. Uh, spilt over into the lives of those around us that we can take part in to help with. And I look forward to that taking place. But the full of being desire is God's work, a want and a willingness to serve the Lord. You remember the example that the Lord gave us at the Lord's Supper? Here's God in the flesh. He's manifested in the flesh of Jesus Christ, God himself as a man. And when they go into the upper room, and the guys begin to gather around the table, what does their Lord do? Him being Lord. He takes off his girdle, and he goes over, and he begins to serve them, doesn't he? He begins to clean them up, help them with the needs they had. And you remember Peter said, oh, he said, don't touch me, Lord. Said, no. And he said, if I don't, Peter, give me a little story. And Peter said, oh, he said, Lord, wash me thoroughly. Wash me from head to toe. Clean me up, Lord. Clean me up that I might be used by you, Lord. God wants our desire, not our doing, in other words. Jesus didn't say your work, working is important. Jesus said, thank you for serving me. That's what Jesus says. Thank you for serving me. It's an honor. That honor comes from a desire. That desire comes from the truth of God's word. That desire comes from the truth of God's word through the spirit of God himself, the light of Christ within a man Amen. that wants to serve, that loves to serve, that loves to tell people about the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, that loves for the congregation to know that his light is a life for Christ. And that he wants them to have this same very, this very same light, full of desire. He says, in being filled with honesty, that involves several, several things. And just to mention a few, Proverbs 12, 17, an honest witness tells the truth, but a false witness tells lies. Proverbs 12, 22, the Lord Detests lying lips, but he delights in people who are trustworthy. Proverbs 14, 5. An honest witness does not deceive, but a false witness pours out lies. 1 Chronicles 29, 17. I know, my God, that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity. I know, my God, that you test the heart and you are pleased with integrity. All these things I have given willingly and with honest intent, and now I have seen with joy how willingly your people who are here have given to you. So how would you rate your honesty today? That's a question just for us personally. How would we rate our honesty today? Would we rate it with a pure heart? And oftentimes we think about things and we get so close sometimes to the Lord that we can even be fooled ourselves, I do believe. And do so many things in so many ways that we feel that we're up to power on rating ourselves and being where God would have us to be with integrity, being honest, being truthful. But I come up with a a question on my own. It's, the Lord kind of gave it to me as a, a good question, I think, for us all. Is I always look at it like this. 
How honest am I with God? Am I, am I honest enough with God today that I can stand before God himself and say to the Lord face to face, my Lord, I'm honest enough with you that I am merely faithful to my wife. And I have nobody else that I desire to even look upon other than my wife. God standing face to face to you, am I honest enough to say to you that I don't have any more than I have because I have been faithful to giving you the tenth that you've asked me to give you through your word? Amen. That's a big question, friends, because I know for a fact today, I don't have any idea about any of you, but I do know a fact today from several in the past and over the ministry that I have seen and I have watched that have so much more because they weren't faithful, because they weren't honest. My friends, listen, the book of Nehemiah, the Lord told Nehemiah one of the only things, not one of the only things, one of the three things that you need to be a faithful servant to me is honesty. Honesty. I can honestly stand here before you today and before my God and say to you, since my wife and I surrendered our hearts and to the, to the Lord Jesus Christ and got saved, that I have not neglected, my wife and I have not neglected on our tithing nor our offerings. Amen. I can say that honestly. Can you say that honestly? If you can, praise God. But make sure it's an honest answer. Because in this position, again, it is one of the highest Positions that you can be called to. God calls us to be faithful in all things, not this, 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 and this, and neglect this, but God says we must be faithful in all things according to this, His Word. Are we that faithful? Are we that honest? You know, giving to charities are good, but it's not tithing to the storehouse, friends. It's not what God's word says. And then we get to one of, I guess probably, is the one of the most controversial statements used in selecting pastors and deacons that there is. And so many people have gone in so many different directions with it. And I want to share with you tonight <clears throat> what I truly believe God's word reveals to us about it. After doing much studies, after looking into it, studying it long and hard, looking at others, some of the most profound uh, philosophers that we have, uh, educators and theologians, uh, schools that we have, and I, I'm referring to many of our great theologians, theologians, but first of all, he says to be the husband of one wife. He's talking here to us about being above reproach. Being above reproach. In relation to women, he must be the husband of one wife. And the Greek reads that a one woman man. That's what the Greek reads. So I want to shock you tonight probably because so many people have heard so many things and so many people have sat under so many people uh, saying that this is what it means and this is what it means, but let's look at what it truly means tonight. Let's look at what it truly means tonight. First of all, Paul is not referring to a leader's marital status. Does that put a shock in you? Paul is not referring to Timothy and teaching these men that are going to become leaders. He's not talking about a marital status. He's referring to moral issue here. Moral issue. He's referring to sexual behavior. I'm going to explain to you why that is. The reason that is is that... <laughs> Excuse me. Many men have only been married once, but are not one women, one women men. Many men with one wife are unfaithful to that wife. Of course, this goes 
This teaching goes as far as for the wife and the husband. But he says here that it's a moral issue. It's a sexual behavior. I know for a fact, I personally, pastors, so many that have gotten put out of the ministry over this very thing because they were unfaithful to their wife. But they never seen, they never understood, they didn't have the insight and understanding, I, I guess, or, or, or didn't have the strength to, to stand on the solid foundation and find strength in the Lord to resist the temptation. I've shared my story or two with you. There's been about three times there's been women approach me and approach me in the wrong way and I had to just flat out let them know, hey, this is, I'm like uh, Joseph. I'm out of here. I'm out of here. It's a sexual problem because many men have only been married once but are not one woman men. Remaining married to, the, to one woman is commendable. It truly is. We've celebrated in this church many of our uh, elderly people that's been married 50, 60, 65 years and praise God. How wonderful that is. That's rare today, by the way. There ain't too many people that do that today. There's not too many people that go that far. For the very reason of this moral issue in which Paul is having Timothy to address among these men that he's about to elect to build the church. It's very important that you have the Spirit of God. It's very important that you're truthful. It's very important that you're filled with honesty. It's very important that you're a husband of one, being a one-woman man. That's very important, God says. Being married for a long time is not any indication or guarantee of moral purity, friend. I know from church I pastored before I got here. Sad to say the deacon body was so intertwined with sexual adultery. That it was pathetic. And I went and confronted some of them about it. I told them about it. Let them know that I knew that it was wrong and that it wasn't right. But what did they do? They kept on down the line they were going. They kept on living the life they were living. Oh, but they were deacons in the church. They were people to look up to. They were examples in the church. And over half of the church knew what they were doing. Now, he's talking about a moral issue here, friends. He's talking about a sexual issue here. It's very important that we understand this. Why does Paul mention this as a qualification? Because it's where so many leaders seem to fall. I guarantee you everybody in here knows some minister that has fallen for that very reason. I'd almost guarantee you that. And then after they have fallen, they become so, so overwhelmed, not realizing what has happened. The failure to be a one-woman man has put more men out of ministry than any other sin. Some say that he's talking about polygamy here. He's not talking about polygamy, having more than one wife. At one time, I was and I thought, you know, living in the Middle East and living among these people, I can understand that's probably what God's saying here. Because I saw firsthand what it was like for a man to appear to love two women, to have two wives. I see them in grocery stores, the Middle Easterners, you'd see them in the grocery store, they'd have two wives, three wives, some of them have four or five wives. I went one time up in the mountains to a shack and he had two wives and I told you the story about how one of them was all huddled up by his side and she must have been the young love of his life and here's the other wife down in the corner of the Bedouin tent cooking bread over a hot smoky fire and the smoke rolling up in her face and, and I could just see and experience the bitterness eye contact with this young lady that was sitting by the shack. 
and the jealousy. And I thought, that's exactly what they're talking about. How in the world can one uh, possibly direct a church in the right way without loving this one more than that one or having all the controversy that there would be? Polygamy wasn't even practiced in the first century society. Divorce was so common in that part of the world at that time that if a lady, if, if a man wanted to go out and have sex with another woman, he'd just divorce her. If she didn't cook his biscuits right, he'd divorce her. <laughs> kind of sad, funny, but it's sad. It's true. But polygamy wasn't practiced during that time. God does not rule out a man whose spouse has died and then remarried. God does not rule out a man who's been divorced. The Lord permitted remarriage when divorce was caused by adultery. In the scriptures, the Lord himself permitted this. The Lord permitted when an unbelieving spouse initiates the divorce. It did not prevent him from becoming a leader in the church. Another view is a man's sin nature when he got saved. Say, well, I got saved after the fact. Well, that's neither here nor there. What God is talking about here is that moral issue. And I believe in all my heart that, and I'll tell you why I believe that, a part of why I believe that is because of what God's word says. God talks so much in his word about the jealousy that he has. God talks so much about him being the, the, the bride or the groom and us being the bride. And when we, we, we fornicate or we, we commit adultery, how God looks at it, how it must break his heart. But I do believe in all my heart that word proves and, and, and testifies that a man, once he's saved, at that moment, the word does say that is the moment that you're accountable for. From that time back, Everything's been wiped clean. You've been, by the grace of God, forgiven of any and all sin. That's the word of God. That's what God's word says. But from that point on, you're accountable. The point is not to have the character of sexual sin after conversion. What does Romans 12, 1 and 2 said? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your rightful service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that what is good and perfect will of God. Oh, my friends, listen. Sometimes we get it so confused. But I pray that God's helped us tonight. I pray that God's shown you some things tonight. I, Pray that you understand tonight that these are important issues because the position is so important. The position is so important because we're going to be accountable to the Lord. We're going to be accountable to one another. We're going to be accountable to those that are in need of the love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ around us. And it makes it so important. A one-woman man is devoted in his heart and mind to the woman who is his wife with the love, with the spirit, with the truth, with the desire and honesty to serve the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Scripture is clear. Sexual sin is a reproach that never goes away, friend. That's what the Bible says about it. I mean, adultery is one of the, one who lacks sense, who destroys themselves, and it wounds one and disgraces one. <clears throat> Whole reproach will not be blotted out. Whose reproach will not be blotted out? Except by the forgiveness of sin. Paul says failure to keep the body pure and control results in being disqualified for us being in the position of preaching the word of God. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. Because you see, sometimes that's why I asked my brother Robert, and I want to thank you, brother Robert, for filling in that Wednesday night that you filled in. 
And I want to thank Brother Jim for filling in the Wednesday night that he filled in. I want to thank Brother Ronnie for all the times that he's filled in. Because that's a part of serving in the way that you'll be serving when you become a, a leader of being a deacon of the body of Christ. Is sometimes the pastor's away. Sometimes the pastor might be gone. And you'll be asked upon to come. And when you come, come with a desire. Come with a heart of truth. Come desiring to feed the flock something that will help them to see and understand the precious Savior a little bit more. Help them to understand how serving the Lord is such a delight. And I've heard many say, and I've said it before in my own, own way, uh, I'll tell you something, friends. I don't know much. I'm not very well educated, to be honest. But if you were to take preaching away from me, I don't know what I'd do. I love it that much. Brother Fred can, can testify to what that's like. I remember sitting in Jordan when we first got to Jordan. I was so used to preaching the Word of God, and I wasn't very good at it. still not very good at it. But I remember sitting out in the congregation with my wife. We'd go to services and the preacher would be preaching. And I'd sit there and I'd start crying. I'd say, oh God. God, I want to preach. God knew my heart. God knew my desire. It wasn't long until one of the pastors of the church said, Brother Relford said, would you fill in for me? And then word began to get around and I'd preach here and there and little church, Baptist church we was close to there where we lived by Dr. Matt Hattie. He let me fill in quite often because he traveled a lot. Oh, it thrilled my soul. It thrilled my soul, my friends, to get up and share the precious word of God with people. Just to try to get across a little something new to them that might help them in their walk, to walk a little closer to the Lord, to understand how gracious God is to us. That's the desire and the truth of God's word and the light that he is in us. And I see it in some of you. And I praise God for that. As Brother Kenny and Sister Lori and Brother Ronnie and Sister Shelby come tonight, you know, one last thing I want to share with you about the Lord, and this is another part of what verse 13 says. And that is the witness that you're going to be. The witness that you're going to be. It means being a step above everybody else. That's what it's going to mean, friends. It means one put on a pedestal. And that's not sinful pride, by the way. It's just simply one that's put on a pedestal in a sense that deacons don't seek it, but they're worthy of it because of the desire that's within their hearts and lives. It means one serves with humility. They will be exalted by the Lord. Oh, yes, you'll get exalted by the Lord. You'll get exalted by the church. You'll get exalted with those you serve sometimes. Those who serve well will see God's power and grace in their lives even more so than you've seen it because of being in the position that you'll be in. God wants our desire, not our doing. Jesus said, your walk is important. He says, thank you for serving me. And that's what Christ wants. Christ just wants us to be faithful. He wants us to be humble. He wants us with all of our heart to be filled with the Spirit, to be filled with truth, and to be honest in what we do for the glory of God, that we might glorify the Father <coughs> to the glory of the Lord. I don't know what God said to you tonight. I pray that God has refreshed your mind or showed you something. But I do know this, I know that if you have any questions or you have any needs, the Lord is the one to come to. You can come forward and I'll pray with you. The altar's open and you can come and pray.
but walk close to the Lord. Look to the Lord. Serve Him with a desire and a willingness to glorify the Father in all that you do. As we stand and sing, what number, brother? Would you stand as we sing 310, please? Dismiss us, brother, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to have been able to spend our day in the house, your house, this morning and tonight. Dear Father, we're just thankful for the freedom to do this. And we, we ask this, this freedom to never stop. Dear Father, we're thankful for the messages that we've heard today. And dear Father, may we run them through our mind and this week and, and study them and to, to think about them. Dear Father, we just uh, want to thank you for this church for this congregation and for this pastor and for our music. Thank you for the sacrifice Jesus did on the cross. Your Father, just uh, bless us now as we leave and uh, bless us this week. Forgive us for our many failures and forgive us of our many sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.